Preparing to live stream the meeting, it now says. Setting up your meeting for YouTube alive. 50%. 55%. Hundred percent. Mine has just said like meeting is now streaming live on YouTube since apparently since you clicked it. So. Yes. So you could see me counting to 100% live on YouTube now. And I press um, mute on my YouTube because otherwise I need to listen to myself with a certain delay. And instead I welcome everybody. And I also record to my computer this. So we have it safe for, forever and for everybody. Uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, live. This is something we usually don't do much on the gauntlet for safety reasons. When we do, uh, when we play games, then sometimes it can happen so that after a game, somebody considers that they don't want to see something actually published on the internet. And so um, it makes sense to only record and then decide later after 24 hours or so to publish. Here, we consider that we don't need this, that uh, we still want to be uh, safe with each other. Um, and take care for each other, but we, since we don't play characters, but instead we are here to discuss character keepers um, and tell you about them, the, the most amazing ideas we have about character keepers and what we like about them and how we do them and what fascinates us. Um, we consider this to be safe to be like broadcasted live. If there's anything, you can write that in the YouTube chat live. And um, otherwise, I'm, we, we are also possibly happy to just nerd off uh, on our own. I am Gerrit Reidinghaus. I'm from Germany, um, long-standing Gauntlet member, um, um, a big fan of live-action online games, uh, which some people just call online labs, but I prefer the term live-action online game because I like that my the things I do have the word game in it. It's, I think, the most important for me. And that also means that my character keepers often are playing in that realm of freeform tabletop RPG, or however you want to call them, or online lab. Uh, but not only, I also am the host of the Play Aids archive uh, from the Gauntlet. That's a free um, folder on Google Drive where everybody can send me a keeper they have and uh, get it added there about your favorite games. We have 377 games and Play Aids currently in this folder and it is growing faster than ever. So it's really cool to see the character keeper culture um, is, is spreading and we receive keepers from all over the internet, so to say. So I'm, I'm, re I'm really, really glad that um, this resource is there and with us. So um, then I would, I would say, let's take a short round, like introducing ourselves. And then we, uh, afterwards, we share what we like about Keepers. But first of all, Dono, who are you? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Donald McCarthy. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm based in Ireland. Um, and I guess I've been playing and, and GMing games for longer than I care to count. <laughs> and on the gauntlet for almost five years. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess I've been creating quite a lot of character keepers in the last couple of years, uh, having doing a lot of new systems uh, that I haven't played before or that haven't uh, already got character keepers. So I think um, while, while some of our other panelists are very technically adept, I, I am, going, dipping my toe into the shallow end on quite a lot of different uh, systems. Thank you very much. Um, Bethany, who are you? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Bethany Harvey. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm in the US, uh, as if you couldn't tell from my accent. Um, and um, I, I have not made anywhere near as many character keepers as Donna or probably any of them, uh, any of you. Um, I do tend to make character keepers anytime I'm playing a new game that doesn't have one or, uh, and I make character keepers for my own games. And in fact, I tend to write games starting as character keepers now. Um, I facilitate a whole lot of uh, GM-less games. So 
I, I try to make sure the character capers are easily readable and accessible to everyone. There's no like separate GM knowledge. Everyone has to know everything. Indeed, yeah. That makes pretty unique keepers. And Mike, who are you? Hi, everybody. I'm Mike. I use <clears throat> he and pronouns, and I'm in the heartland of the United States, smack in the middle. And um, I love games. I just love all kinds of games. And my local area, there tends to be one particular game that's most popular, and it's not my favorite. So I like to explore other games. And sometimes the best way to find an outlet for that is online. And oftentimes I'm playing with people who maybe haven't played the game before, maybe only sort of glanced over the materials, you know. So I like to be able to provide character keepers for them. Uh, so to help them kind of organize and create characters and, and get started with the game. And that's a great starting point. So character keepers really helpful for that for me. And as a result, I ended up creating a few and uh, yeah, learning, learning on the job, so to speak. <laughs> Very cool. So great to have you all. So now let's let's jump in with one question uh, for each of you, which is like, what what is like what is what is your passion for character keepers? Like, is uh, what what do you love about them? What makes you excited? Like, is there something which you would like to say there? So this is what especially interesting for me, or generally for also for others. Don't know, can you make a start? Yeah, so I mean, I, I imagine that this is going to be shared by all of us because I think it's such a great way for everyone at the table virtually um, to know what the deal is with all of the characters, you know, because um, this is one thing that really surprised me when I joined the Gauntlet to see this in action because I'm so used to sitting at a table and not really knowing what's across the table from me in another player's hands. I have an idea over several sessions, right? I get to know their character, but when we use a character keeper, we can very easily see what everyone else can do. And then we can give them an opportunity to play to that. You know, we know someone else has a move and we say, hey, it would be really cool to see that. So I find it really, um, you know, uh, freeing as a player and as a GM to, to have that common knowledge amongst the group. Um, the other thing, uh, is that, you know, we're going to be looking at some, you know, probably sophisticated character keepers today, but, you know, I think it's so easy to put together something that allows you to play the game, like a minimal viable product, right? It's just a spreadsheet where everyone keeps their stuff and it doesn't need to be fancy. Uh, but I think, uh, obviously, the, the techniques that we'll talk about today help you to do things quicker or easier um and learn the system but you know it's not difficult i think to do you know a really basic thing that does the, does the job thank you very much uh, bethany uh, what do you love especially um i i suppose i'm repeating uh what donna said a little bit and that it's i like being able to see all of the characters on one screen um I particularly like seeing things aside from just stats and moves. Uh, you know, bonds are very helpful because they're you can see how you're related, how your character is related to their character, uh, and you can play with that. Um, a lot of them will have a little notes section at the bottom, which is very good for keeping track of what's going on with that character when you need an idea to to you know, oh, who would I like to who would I like to run into? Oh, this this person has a has a beef with me. Perfect. I'll run into them. <laughs> you know? um, I think being able to see that, I I personally would have a very hard time remembering that if everyone had their, you know, sep when everyone has separate paper character sheets that you never see, it's hard to keep in mind all of those other details, even if you know their their class or their playbook and their basic, what they're good at and what they're bad at you forget the the details especially between sessions um the other thing about character keepers is that there are they're easy to make 
uh, you can use a lot of functions and a lot of automation, or you can just start typing into the cells. Uh, you don't need to know JavaScript. You uh, don't need to know HTML, which you do for most you know, virtual tabletops. You need to know at least one of those. Uh, and once you have one for a basic structure or a, a basic system, they're very easy to modify. Sometimes all you have to do is change the move names. True. Yeah, indeed. And uh, Mike, what about you? Do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, everyone's had great points so far. I agree with um, the at a glance information is super helpful. It helps maintain the flow in the conversation. You don't have to like interrupt people to like, oh, what's your character's name again? You know, it can help you like avoid misgendering players and their characters because it's a quick glance. Oh, this is the pronouns they use, you know, that sort of thing. Little touches like character portraits, you can just see them right there. A lot of it is just like, and like Dana said, with the uh, the low barrier to entry, right? Like um, you can like go, go to Pinterest and find a character and you don't have to like go home and like print it out or like paint a miniature or something, you know, like that you would otherwise do face to face to have some representation of your character. Like it's just right there. You just click it, <laughs> you know, and Creating it can be easy, but interacting with it can be really easy too. You know, if you're playing with people who've never used a keeper before, there's a lot of those automated functions that can help them. Like the first time that they're creating a character in their system, there's so many options. There's so much information to try to keep in your head at once. It's like here, pick, pick from this list, you know, this, this is your options here. And you can just kind of go through there instead of trying to like wrestle with this whole book. And so, that's something I really like about keepers is just keeping, you know, those hurdles short at the initial stages um, to make sure that people don't get overwhelmed right away. Oh yeah, very much agree. I might, I would like to add something which I personally, and that doesn't go for everybody, is um, I likes to do when we, when I'm in a session as a player, I really like to use the time where my character is idle, like with other scenes, to use that to, to write something. And a character keeper is uh, my way to get this output into a useful position. So I write something about my character. I do like a session diary in the meantime. I compile pictures, like either on a, on a separate board or on a separate tab in the keeper. That's what I mostly do nowadays. I um, write comments about my character or further describe the character. And I, I hope this is useful information for other players, for the GM, that is a nice memory. And for me, character keepers are also an artifact of play. And nothing is better than like a year, many years later, going back to a character keeper and looking at the stories which are hidden between numbers or and, and little dots of information. And you find this one piece of equipment you have and you remember the story about this one. And all these things which are made, mem which are memorable and can be brought back to my mind. That is something I also very much enjoy about character keepers like this. It's, they are an artifact of play, something we created together. Yeah, thank you very much for this intro round. And now we go to the, the, the grid of it, like the, we, we asked everybody to bring like a keeper, which they are excited about and uh, share that keeper with us and what makes this keeper interesting or worth having a look at. And some of the people who might, um, uh, might be new to character keeper making think like this is like going over the top of what I'm currently doing. But our hope is that um, you don't consider this as you either understand it or you don't, but you consider this as a learning experience. You see something, you find it exciting, you pick it up, you also want to try it. And most of the things you can actually Google and they are actually not that complicated if you want to start trying them. And if they're too complicated, if this is not the type of fun for you, then make a simpler one. They are equally as well and often the more complex ones are in the end not working, I have to admit, because I'm one of those people who make too complex keepers sometimes <laughs> when not working as expected. Um, yeah, so um, Bethany, like keeping the oil here, would, would you mind sharing 
a keeper with us and tell us about it? Uh, sure, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, here, I'll click this one. How do I share my screen? Let me see. I hope I allowed this to everybody. Um, All participants are allowed to share their screen, yes. Okay. How do I do this? I don't. No. Uh, I actually don't see an option to do that, although it's probably on here. So in Sorry, the, in the middle, there's this share screen in green even. Oh, there it is. I, I had it shrunk up so much that it had just like covered that. <laughs> yeah. The, the setup for play is maybe not the one for. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> for Definitely. Other purposes. Two different things. Uh, there we go. Okay, that should should be working hopefully. It does. Awesome. Okay, uh, yeah. So this is actually a character keeper that uh, it, it is it is a character keeper that is being edited at the moment um, for my game Unincorporated, and uh, some things that I, I think are possibly interesting about it. Um, hold on a sec. Did I just did I just jump off of it in the this is a. Uh, we are now looking at. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hold on a sec. I. I need to relearn about this whole screen sharing thing and and um, how it how it is possible and how it's done, because clearly I don't. Don't have this, it done. Like I'm jumping around in tabs and stuff, and you all are yes, seeing yeah. what I'm jumping into. I, I'm sorry. No Obviously, screen no, we... sharing is not my is not a part of character keepers that I've <laughs> used to. Um, all right. So I think you're seeing the right one right now, right? Yes. Yeah. Hopefully. OK, excellent. No, we're looking so you have at a little the chart keeping. in the corner. Yes. OK. <laughs> uh, yes. OK, this is, uh, this is kind of a, a demonstration of what you can do. So some, I guess, bells and whistles you can add to even a very simple character keeper. This game is it has no playbooks and no classes so everyone has the same options um which means it doesn't really need a whole lot of automation what is here though is this column over here in the corner this is this is basically the reference sheet that you would copy and hand out to all your players the necessary rules that you need to remember about about uh, dice rolls and about how to use tokens are all right here in this one column. It's a pretty simple game. With a more complicated game, you'd probably you'd need a whole tab uh, for this, but it's very nice to have. That's all in this one file that you're working in. Um, also, with this particular game, I, I wrote it in the character keeper, so it has uh, the setup. You can also do it's all right here. The references for uh, for this game, you choose lines, veils, and wishes as your setup. You answer some questions. You pick a plot. You write down the setting details, and it's all right here in the first tab. And then you click over to the characters tab, and then this is a more typical character keeper, where you have drop downs to select those questions to answer. And this is. This is the real. This is the coolest thing about this character keeper, and uh, it is not Ooh. my invention. It's Garrett's invention. <laughs> right, no, the, the the cross is the coolest thing about this character keeper. <laughs> the cross will be the coolest thing about this character keeper if I can ever make it work. Uh, in I, what I would like to do is you put in your character name here and. Either you set your stats here and it puts your initials in the right spot on the chart, or you put the, your initials in the right spot on the chart and it gives you the, your stats on the characters. I would like to do that. I haven't found a way to implement it that doesn't break very easily though. Uh, but if you wanted to roll your dice right here, you don't need a separate dice roller. Uh, you pick your character, you pick your stat, you click one of these boxes and up here, oh, look, I failed. <laughs> Oh no, very cool. 
That's okay. Failure in this game is probably more fun than success. So let, let me play the naive character right. keeper here for a second and say like, why don't you use the random function? I Isn't do. there a random function in spreadsheets? Ah, <laughs> this, the random function unfortunately shows uh, a different number to each user. It, it's not universal to the users as, uh, yeah, as, um, I don't know, this, this guy named Garrett <laughs> discovered. <laughs> this is all actually Garrett's uh, invention here. I just put a few twists on it, like being able to uh, select the, the character and the stat to modify it. The basics are like the, the engine behind it is this right here, this random seed generator that you have to copy into here. This is a, this does require a little bit of setup from the, the GM or it's a GMless game. So the facilitator or anybody who has a little tiny bit of technical knowledge uh, and that you generate a random number and you have to copy it over here so that it's the same for everybody so that the dice rolls are show up for the same for everybody. Also, I added a little thing here where, because this game can have a lot of settings that you create by just modifying questions and plots. Um, where is my dice roll seven? Uh, this particular sheet has, can have multiple settings. So these are different tabs for different settings. And if you, as the GM or facilitator, just type in, it has to be exactly the name of the tab with the correct setting on it. It will change. Let's say, I, I just put setup here. And then you go to the characters. It'll show a different set of drop down questions here that you can answer that correspond with that tab. Ah. That's really the only automation in this game. Cool. Very neat, yeah. So it's just that, copying uh, one random number. Yeah. Have you seen that before, Mike? I've never seen that before. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I, as soon as you opened this keeper, I got so excited by this, this diagram in the corner. And I was just like, I don't even know what this game is. I think I've seen some of your snippets on it, but I see that that glyph and the colors. I'm like, I want to play this game. I want to figure out how that works. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. Same. Cool. <laughs> yeah. This, um, like I said, what I really wanted to do is be able to put your character's initials or your initials in one of these boxes and have it just automatically show up in your stats over here. I, I haven't found a way to do that. That doesn't, like I said, break very easily because I, uh, it's hard to tell if someone's going to put their player initials, their character initials, exactly how they're going to do that. If mm -hmm. two characters have the same initials, things like that. I, I haven't figured out how to, uh, how to code for not doing things exactly in a specific way. Oh, we One need of these to days. wait for our artificial intelligence for doing that, right? Uh, your, your Ouija board trick may actually be the secret to it, I think. Yeah, we, we need to see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also causing headaches. So just, just yeah. like thinking about it, like, like <laughs> oh my God, and somebody has a middle name and yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, it gets a little complicated. Um, I. I've made it work, but only if I, I can make it work because I know what needs to be input where. Um, um, other than that, I think like the updates, I the, the reason I have all of these different settings in the same sheet here is that that way I don't have to make the same changes to multiple sheets because the characters tab is the same for everything. The lookup tab is the same for everything. The dice roll is the same for everything. Oh, here is, here is the other cool thing that I almost forgot. So this has a town tab that it's really, you know, most of the information is also going to be here on this setup tab in here. But let's say you're playing multiple sessions and you want like a little more space to make notes and you also want a map. If you come over here, this here, this is an editable Google drawing. Uh oh. You click on the little corner there, edit, and it comes up with a pop-up which hopefully you can see. Yes, wow. Where you can you can start adding things as if it was just a regular Google drawing. Uh, 
that is that is the coolest new thing I've found in in Google Sheets. This is great. You can you can create a town map. You could create a relationship map, which I love relationship maps. If you've ever played a game that I was facilitating, you know this. Um, and on this one, you can you know keep a list of people, and then you can mark the people here on the map, mark where they live, the places. You can put those on the map where they live. This this background here is just a it's just a um, uh, vector drawing that you can replace the background with you know, whatever you want. Wow, good good buy up. Like independently standing Google drawing, whose link you never find again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it's actually embedded in the document, um, which makes things a lot easier if you're sharing. If you're sharing it, say to the uh, the play aids folder. It's not linked to a specific drawing out there somewhere that someone may or may not delete. Cool. I don't Thank know you. when they added this to Google Docs, but it's, I'm happy they did. I didn't know about this. That's fascinating. Thanks for this. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Do you want to add something or do we have uh, any? No, I, I can stop sharing here. And what, what what I would like to say is that what I also like about this random seed thing uh, is that you get uh, statistics for the session. So I I just did a prototype for this. Um, so it still has to be spelled out. And also thank you, Bethany, for making this random seed, which I just made like as a prototype and you made it work. So this is the, the first time this is like completely in implemented and used. Um, but um, yeah, so what, what I was hoping is that um, that these stats already built in into the character keeper can be fun. Like you could even make it that complex. I was thinking about like making a second version where you have independent stats per player. So you could see who really had like a, a streak of bad luck and who is just um, always thinking them themselves into that box. <laughs> you know, you know these players, right? <laughs> So I, I would find this interesting um, and it could go beyond and sure there are dice rollers out there and they are great and they work fine and I also like to use them, uh, but sometimes they are not doing exactly what you need and then being able to do something for yourself, for your game, for your design, that is, that is why I wanted to investigate how this could work within a keeper. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Um, so I would like to move over to Mike. If you have something you would like to share with us. Certainly. So I'm also sharing a keeper that I made, or at least I'm attempting to. <laughs> Can we see it here? Yes. Fantastic. So this is uh, a character keeper for Pasión de las Pasiones, a game I very much love, by a designer I very much love. And uh, I was very proud of this keeper. It's very simple. It's very basic. But it's the first time that I figured out dependent drop-down lists. This was like my great white Moby Dick, like... <laughs> technical accomplishment. I myself, I'm not a software programmer or anything like that. I think I took like basic HTML like in school, like one class, you know, and I took like the basic Microsoft Office courses. I don't know JavaScript or HTML very much like Bethany was saying, but this was like just enough of a mental puzzle that would give me that little bit of serotonin at the end where it's like, oh yes, Eureka. Okay, so in Passionis, it's um, a PBTA game. You have playbooks, your playbooks, you have different options that you choose depending on your playbook. So a couple of the things that you would pick depending on your playbook would be a different move, right? Um, as well as certain props. These are things that your character in this telenovela would have that would like be prominent on screen. But so Mike, it's, it's all empty. It's, it's not working. 
I know it's like such a blank canvas. So let's go ahead and pick a playbook for uh, column number one. We could be La Beleza, The Beauty, El Caballero, The Gentleman. Uh, I remember very much enjoying playing uh, Adonia in one game. Um, and I had an eye patch and it was very intense. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so now that you've picked Adonia, some things start to fill in. You'll see that you know every character has a question that fills in for you automatically. Um, your relationships fill in for you. This time on, which is like the uh, the little intro prompt fills in for you. So all of this is done. You don't have to go and try to copy from the PDF, which probably has separate lines, causing you to have to delete all these extra line breaks and all these things. You can just kind of put them all there in the keeper. And now when you pick your props, Oh, it's all the props that are available to the La Doña. Tons of jewelry or a beautiful mansion. <gasps> and um, when you go down to moves, right, the big one, hey, here's the four move titles that are available to your playbook, such as such a bad child. And that's automatically going to fill in the description of the move. I play a lot of PBTA games, so this style of keeper is very useful for that situation. Advancements might involve that you take a, a move from a different playbook. So for those, you're gonna have to type them in manually. There's, there's not really a great way to, to do that, but that's okay. That, that's something, you, that's a bridge you can cross when you get to it. Um, but the cool thing is that, you know, if I go over here and let's be the beauty, now you've got your different ones in this tab. Now, you know, there's other ways to do this. Um, you could just create columns dedicated to each playbook. That's totally fine, especially if your playbooks or classes or, or other things aren't as symmetrical as they are in PBTA games. You know, like I think of certain masks playbooks being pretty distinct from another. Nahual has some pretty distinctive character choices for that. It might be best to just dedicate a column to that playbook, but if they're pretty much line up with each other like this, this is a pretty great way to do that. You know, here's the ice queen from the beauty, you know, it just fills in for you automatically. Hopefully it saves a little bit of trouble. Now this is a little bit older. This is before checkbox integration. I would definitely uh, add some checkboxes here. Now that we've got those, that's just a nice little feature instead of hitting like X or whatever, you know, it's not as exciting. Um, now the way that this is accomplished is you, I'll, I'll show in the data tab here. Um, th there's basically a couple functions in place. So what these checkboxes, these options for your playbooks are all listed here in the data tab here under playbooks. So this first column has all the info and all the playlists. I'll, El Camelo is a crazy <laughs> playbook. You should definitely play it sometime if you have an option. So when you make that choice, this data validation, if you right click, you can click data validation. It kind of shows the cell range. I've, don't be afraid about the dollar signs. It's just for the absolute reference. So just, just do it for fun. And it kind of shows you where they are. It looks at that range, it picks them. And then you go to data and now, oh, you know, it's probably a little bit much to get into just for the intro, but you should definitely check out the sheet to see all of the uh, formulas here. But essentially it's a combination of index match and then creating a second spot where all those choices are copied just for player one. And then your other data validations now referencing, I'm pointing at the screen, <laughs> um, that new space that's filled out and pulling from those sections instead, right? Yeah, I probably, I, I don't know how much of that information that the viewers are gonna be able to absorb from that very <laughs> brief and uh, not as detailed description, but we can go into it later if someone's really interested about uh, dependent dropdown lists. Yeah, and I heard there are also some amazing blog articles out there which describe the basics of character keepers written by a certain member of the panel, Mike. I'd love to read them. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. I, I really enjoy this feature as well. And yes, like recently, I think the, the trend has more to be uh, happened that you have like one playbook per column. But I see also advantages in having uh, um, this lookup style, especially in games where a playbook can be picked more than once, for example, then this is just the best option to go. And like for OSR style kind of indie games, this happened to me frequently that um, I, for example, was running a campaign where we in the end had 16 characters in there, like with people coming and going from the table and uh, or for worldwide wrestling, the series, this also happens. And then this playbook by a column by, so playbook by column style just doesn't work that you could copy them. Yeah, but in the end, um, I, I like this like easy, I went down it also. I'm a fan of picking the, col the column which suits me as a person. Am I, am I the third in the list or the second or I'm happy to be the first? Because in the end, most of the time when GMs are busy, they will go from left to right, right? <laughs> That's how our world is working. And so I don't want to be tempted not to take a playbook just because it's on, on first position. They're usually different colors too. <laughs> yes. So you can pick the color you like best. I, I really need to go back and edit some of my earlier ones that were very like one playbook per column uh, and add a little bit more automation so you can just pick a column and then pick your playbook. Ooh, like I want to be the beauty, but I also want to have the salmon column. I don't want the right, peach column. Yeah. I want to be the first column so that I can put my video <laughs> window over here and still see my column, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which is a big thing for me. No, no, do you have a keeper to share, share with us? Yeah, but um, I think be prepared to be completely underwhelmed by the technical, uh, the technicality of this. Um, this is a, relieved. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a keeper for a gay, a little uh, indie game uh, that I got last year in the racial justice equality bundle called "This Party Sucks," and there's a couple of things. What a name! That, yeah. <laughs> um, and it should be these parties suck because there's three parties. So the interesting thing for me, right, is about this game is that uh, there is one main character and the game is designed for three players and each of the three players will play that single character uh, in one party each. So if I'm player one, I will play the main protagonist in party one and the second player will play them the same character in party two and third in party three. So it's uh, the character keeper is accurate because there's one character who is important in this game. Um, and when you are not playing the main protagonist, you are either playing other people at the parties or you're playing the situation, you know, the crowd or the, the environment. Um, so what I've done here is, um, you know, in, in the first section, we create our character together. Uh, so it's really just simple text boxes uh, for all of these aspects of your character's life that you want to keep track of. Uh, and then in the second section, we have a design palette, which is like from microscope. So it's just, again, a really simple table for us to put in uh, design elements that we want to see in the game. Uh, and below this, we have all the moves that you make as a uh, as the main character. Um, uh, and again, um, this is just really straightforward uh, to add a comment uh, or a note, sorry, I should say. It's a comment in Excel, but it's a note. Uh, I made the mistake once of putting in comments in Google Sheets and then realized that they would disappear <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just, again, really easy ways of showing the rules uh, once we're in the game, instead of having to refer to the PDF. Uh, so what, what we've done here is that, um, you know, if I, if I put my name in because I'm player number one into this section, right. Uh, the system is designed, if it'll catch up with me. Yeah, so here you can see uh, now it, it'll tell me just at a physical table, we would just pass around the rules and it'd be really easy to keep track of. Uh, but the sheet does this 
really simply, it just tells me that I'm going to be playing the venue in party two, and I'm playing the other people in party three. Uh, and then, you know, we have before every party, the protagonist, you know, decides that they want to do something to cope. Uh, uh, and we have a simple text box to put in some details. And then we pick the type of party that we're going to. And we, again, fill in some details. And then the same thing for, uh, for the guests. So it's, again, it's just a really simple lookup. These are all the options that you can have give some details, uh, as I think uh, we mentioned at the start <laughs> on the gauntlet with character keepers, we love to have pictures of uh, our PCs and NPCs. It's so important to get an instant hit of what they're about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is like a really simple, this is, there's nothing really except data validation here. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of, of drop-downs to help you uh, manage prompts and then a place for you to type in your notes before you get started in the scene. So yeah, this is kind of <laughs> maybe my point at the start is that um, the character keeper you know, maybe needs to be as... So here there's, there's no huge choices, there's no, no huge mechanics that depend on your character but this has everything that you need to play the game, I think. Um, well, that's so neat about it, right? It's yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, one, one part of the thing is that you need to spend tokens in each scene to make moves. Um, and initially, I, you start with three tokens, right? Um, I should really have made these tick boxes because it's more immediately obvious what's happening. Uh, you know, ticket when you spend a token or something like this, instead of having a drop down that you pull out a number of and count down. Um, so this is maybe a change I would make if I if I use this again. Um, but yeah, I think I, my main point here is that it's um, it's really simple. There's no big moving parts. Uh, I, I, if I think if I look at the lists doing the lookups, it is so basic. <laughs> you know, uh, there is nothing hugely complicated going on here. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I think it's good, you know, if you have a drop down, something that's hard to parse. And when I'm running a game or facilitating a game like this, I will say, like, if you want to get a really good idea uh, of what's going on, uh, look at the list tab to get a, a quick hit. And then also what I always do on these options is to add and add your own option here. And the player can go in and just type in their own preference here. Um, and obviously you have to write the, the data validation to include these, um, uh, these cells. But, you know, again, explaining that is really simple, but it gives a lot more power to the players to do it. It's not just a GM thing um, to, to manipulate the character keeper like this. So. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's really basic, but again, it, it does exactly what it needs to do for for this game. And on 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 one glance, people have an idea about what this game is about. Um, so yeah, and, and I, I feel I think like I can like, start playing now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and everything is on one sheet. Uh, and I, you know, usually I just call the main character keeper sheet characters, but here is like protagonist, palace, parties, you know, uh, some nice alliteration to keep everyone in line, you know. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm quite happy. I mean, it's a great game too, you know, uh, definitely uh, all the feels. Definitely cool. Yeah, I wanted to play, but yeah, time needs to allow. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, let me also share something. And it's a, it's a keeper I'm a little bit also proud of because the, all the design happened in that keeper. So I started my game design in the keeper and often my game designs are even based on, um, on a technique, something I figured out would be interesting to play with. And this is for my game Outscored, which uh, won a Golden Cobra, which is a, a LARP competition in 2019. 
And Outscored is about a group of friends with, who try to escape their, their boring town or depressing town by going to university course. They have a passion they share together. And um, the problem is they live in a, a super surveillance state in which uh, every citizen is scored. They have a social score. And if your social score is not good enough, you won't go anywhere. You need for your application, you need a proper score. People can upvote each other, but obviously you don't have like an infinite amount of upvotes. But uh, quite the opposite, for every up upvote you want to make, you also need to downvote somebody else. Um, so to balance out, like to make this more precise. And also in, if in the, in the district, in the town where you are living, if there are bad, badly behaving people and they can't identify who it was, then everybody gets downgraded. So if there's more crime happening, then people in this town sort this out who this was. Uh, before that, everybody gets downgraded. So this is the setup. Um, however, as I said, I started with an idea. And the idea was that when you play in, late in the evening, when it's dark outside and there's not much room in your light, beside from your computer screen, and you're on a video call, then you can see if somebody is looking on a bright screen or on a dark screen, if the dominating color is, is blue or pink, you can see that in people's faces because the only light which is illuminating them is this color. So I thought, why don't can't I make a game out of this? Usually this happens like accidentally, but uh, why not making this like on purpose? And here everybody is working in this keeper and everybody has a separate tab. And that tab has all the character information on the left column, as you can see. And then there's like a large area in just one color. And this one is black. That's the lowest social scores reflecting the black. That means you don't have much light in your face. You are faded out somehow. And if you play this game and if the tech and your laptop uh, or, or screen intensity is good enough, then you actually will see people disappearing <laughs> when they turn black. So here on the test page, I can show you how the other colors look like. So 10 is white. So you're getting bright light into your face, but then you get like some turquoise on it and then it gets uh, I think five is still the same color, but then it goes down to green and closely before you are pink. And that is already quite obvious in your face. So people start getting worried about you. So and when you set the game up, um, I try to make this as simple as possible and give like a couple of options, the name of the region in which we are playing. It's like maybe Hexony and then you pick a university course and all this stuff. Character creation is also super simple in this game. So everybody needs a name and you have some interests and some shared passions. And then on, on the keeper, you have this score, which is controlled on a control sheet because everybody can, um, I, I think I need to pick a role for everybody. Uh, and then we can see what's going on. Um, so here's symbol, for example, and I can vote my colleague Tombak. I can vote them up. And Tombak is this person here is now not black anymore, but pink. Has a score of two because they got voted up. So you can up and down vote each other. And then you click on your screen, you click on a checkbox and you see another player's running to a different color. And that's somehow the idea. And um, yeah, in the play test I had, it, it worked quite nicely as long as the setup is working, but obviously this needs a little bit of preparation and it doesn't work on everybody's setup. But if it works and Donna was with me, I think in, in one of the play tests, uh, it, it can be quite nice. So this is the keeper I wanted to bring uh, to you uh, because it is working on separate sheets and still has interactive elements where a control sheet, which is here, um, is counting all the scores for all the players. And uh, here's also like a parameter setup where you can say from which, um, at which score the, the screen color changes. And you can decide from which score on somebody is not allowed to go to university anymore. And then the, the idea of the game is that um, do 
can can the people arrange that one person at least gets a high enough score to make it to university or will they all degrade down or even be sent to correction whatever that means <laughs> yeah cool yeah that's what i wanted to share with you and so stop screen sharing again um, yeah i mean uh, garrett i i played in this game and it was quite amazing <laughs> to see people's behaviors change as the color is very evident. You know, we were quite careful, I think, to play in an otherwise darkened room and so that the light was was very obvious when it changed. And, you know, it has a huge impact on how you play the game, which I guess is the live action <laughs> element <laughs> of this. Uh, so, yeah, I think, um, uh, like you said, this, the setup involved is a little bit particular, you know, and you have to make sure that everything is exactly right before you start play and then it's um, I think it's pretty straightforward but uh, yeah definitely doing its job yeah if it wasn't that complicated um, then I could imagine it even like for a tread game like where you have like your hit points going down and you see the color on your face this like fading out <laughs> stuff like that why not right or um, bonds in the group like somebody who is like uh, um, when, when bonds only mean something positive or like oh no i don't know like any any kind of currency you have in a game which people can like in a group dynamic accumulate or not and seeing like who's the bright leader at the moment and who's like the the, the person nobody is interested in so why not having an element like this it doesn't have to have the screen turning your face effect but you could even implement this in any other kind of game by just having a badge of like where you currently stand and see how the others judge you. If you want this in your game, it doesn't sound like the, the most optimistic kind of e escapism, um, being rated and downrated, downgraded and stuff like that. Um, but it could be an interesting element depending on the topic of the game. Yeah, waiting to see this implemented also elsewhere. I was talking with some friends about how to play 10 Candles online. 10 Candles is a game where you sit around in person, 10 candles that are burning, and as they extinguish one by one, you know, you sort of get towards the end of the game. But A, having live fire in your home can sometimes be tricky, especially if it's by your computer equipment. And B, you kind of lose this element that's of like the candles kind of going out at unexpected moments. Like you don't can't really maybe somebody breathes sighs too heavily and the candle flickers out or you know they just kind of go out at different times and so now i'm sitting here thinking like can we combine the random seed technology with this screen color changing technology to like randomly determine whether or not the brightness of your screen goes down on your sheet and i was just like wow that's really cool i would love to play that game Oh, Mike, you, you're bringing ideas up here. Oh, no. <laughs> Should we make another round about like making, uh, looking at latest twist and showing it another uh, round of keepers? That would be cool. Um, so um, I think this time maybe, Mike, you can make a start. Sure, I'd love to. Um, yeah, so in terms of games with a twist, let me see here. This one in particular I prepared to share. Of course, I'm, I've lost it now. <laughs> here we go. Um, a good friend of mine, Louise, has created a game called Melody of a Never Ending Summer, which is abbreviated as MONS. It's a game that is inspired by um, Pokemon as well as games like Harvest Moon and um, Stardew Valley, which are all about like these sort of um, agricultural simulators, small town simulators, these video games. And I really liked a, a few things about this sheet. Um, let me see if I can expand it for everyone a little bit more. So the first thing that I kind of liked about this one 
this is just starting in the main characters tab, uh, are these bonds. So you have these emojis here, this heart emoji and this hand emoji. And like Dono says, we got this really helpful note thing. You can just hover over, kind of explain. So you have these duet scenes, you go closer, you check a bond, all mechanical stuff. But what you can do here is delete the heart and leave the hand to indicate if you want any character to be attracted to yours. So this is a way to sort of facilitate this maybe cumbersome, maybe awkward conversation of like, I'd be okay with if our two characters had a romantic relationship, but I wouldn't necessarily be okay with these two characters having a romantic relationship, maybe because of their personality, their age, power dynamics, those sort of things. You can just say, hey, you know, I, I would really not want to have anyone be attracted to my character, so I'll delete the heart. Um, but if you want to say like, oh, I'd be interested with this, you can kind of copy the heart and put that next to one of the other characters and say, hey, you know, that'd be something I would be willing to explore. That might be interesting. And they might do the same. They might do something different. Just a simple way to do that. You don't have to have a big, awkward conversation about it. Just post it right there. I think that's a really cool little thing. So that's just like one small thing. Um, Louise also does some other cool things with emojis like, in the game, there's these elements that are called flower tokens. So to represent that, instead of typing out flower tokens, you just have an emoji of a flower. And so we know that character one has one flower token, right? So cool little details. Yeah. The thing overall, though, that I just love about this sheet, and again, we've, we've talked a lot about how there's a low barrier to entry. You can make these up real quick. But if you enjoy this exercise, if you're designing a character sheet for your game as a way to maybe add value to your game that you're sharing with other people or even selling, putting a little bit of time into these character keepers can be a really cool way to do that. Louise has picked these really awesome fonts, little details, the borders, the color palette, all these different ways and these different tabs that like just it, it immerses me already in the tone and the style and the mood of the game. And, oops, <laughs> gotta bring my window back. I've got a very old MacBook here that moves slow, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, if it'll, if it'll pull up, here we go, okay. Um, We've got, you know, for your the different descriptions of your of your bonds, right? Your little monsters. We start with Willie, who's the wind water patient big mon. You know, you kind of use that to create an idea of like, oh, it's like a pony-sized water buffalo, right? Um, you've got your projects, you can all keep those here. So all these different elements of the game are compartmentalized to these different little things, even little touches like this little corner that's cut out of these. <laughs> The character details to make it look like a manila folder just gets me yeah <laughs> so so yeah just everything here just been shown so much attention to detail so much care and consideration into um the game and i think you know like having this be part of your game like more like people think a lot about oh man i gotta do layout and editing and make my pdf for my game like really nice, like that's really cool and probably might involve some professional help. But this is something that even I think a novice could do with a little bit of trial and error and and maybe reading a couple articles, you know, and you can make a cool uh, element for your game like this. So definitely recommend checking out uh, Louise's game on itch and the, uh, the, the spreadsheet is included there. Cool. Wow. Well, looking at the number of columns, like that went to EEK. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yes. <laughs> so it's really a, a tiny grid to make all this possible, to, to, to fit it exactly yes. as, as you wish, uh, which, yeah, makes, makes this very stylish. Yeah, very cool. Yes. And, and even looking like at, at this here from AC to CE, you know, <laughs> probably, you know, if you weren't as concerned about the very specific um, widths 
four year columns. This could probably be three columns or you know, maybe a couple more with the with the the headers here, but yeah. That's that's definitely something you can do if you want to get more specific with these is just break things down into teeny tiny little columns. Yeah, because you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you always merge them, right? Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Very cool. Uh, Donald, did, did you bring a second paper you would like to share? Yeah, so this uh, is for, uh, I ran Kagamatsu for my face-to-face -face group last March when we moved online. Um, and there's nothing really special about this. Uh, if you played Kagamatsu, you recognize that there is lots of Uh, lots of things that you can, uh, as your character, do with the Kagamatsu. Uh, you can attempt certain moments with them, and then you can win their favor, right? Uh, but when you uh, when you do those things successfully, so if you not just attempt a compliment, but if you successfully give a compliment, um, I've done some um, conditional formatting on this, so that every time you click one on this table, down here, your, ah. uh, your real attempts are, uh, the strike through disappears. Ah. And so here I didn't want, so I want yes. someone to still be able to read what kind of things can happen. And a strike through means you can read it relatively easily, but it's obviously off the table until you, know, you, you click one of your victories then something down here is now suddenly available. Um, so that is um, some really s small thing that I, you know, there was a lot of um, thought I put into this in terms of like, how do you best show the card players? Because, you know, uh, I think as, as Mike said earlier, not everyone is going to read the rules uh, or even the little uh, cheat sheet that comes with the rules for, for Gagamatsu. And again, you want to get it to the table quickly and you want to, You know, explain it once uh, or twice maybe, and then have it be really evident on the, the character keeper. Um, and so that is um, kind of one aspect of this is just simple conditional formatting to, to show what mechanics are available. Um, so that is um, uh, interesting. The other thing that I have here on um, here is, uh, <laughs> I ran the game, so I didn't put a lot of attention into the Kagamatsu um, uh, sheet. But one thing I did do is to say, when I have a list of all the characters, I have also color-coded the same format so that I can really easily look at the sheet and, and, and know when I go back to the villagers who, who I'm thinking of. Uh, so that is, um, uh, that's just a small thing. Um, that helps, um, I guess, unify the experience with just color code. I don't, I don't think color coding is like um, maybe the the best thing to to rely upon because you know uh, people have different screens and with color blindness and everything. But um, it, it's a handy extra to to rely on uh, sometimes. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm quite fond of this, uh, but I haven't seen it. This kind of conditional formatting done very often. Uh, maybe it's just because that kind of mechanic of unlocking uh, options isn't done very often in games, but uh, certainly something that uh, might be interesting or useful to people. Cool, yeah, I, I like it a lot. This yeah, is because, obviously when yeah, I discovered the checkbox too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I played Kagematsu in a Roll20 implementation and I was struggling. Yeah, I was struggling with like what is still available, what is what is not yet available against which uh, difficulty level do I have to roll? And the cheat sheets are there, but they are several. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think the cheat sheets are not quite complete, if I remember correctly. There's a couple of pieces of information that are back in the rules, uh, the full rules. So yeah, I think. Uh, I don't think I highlighted it, but you know, in that column of 
the options you can take. There's also the difficulty and the st statistic you use uh, for it. So uh, again, trying to try to surface as much information as you need to play the game without having to go back to the PDF uh, frequently. Yeah. Sure. Thank you very much for sharing. Okay. Bethany, do you have one more keeper you would like to share? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I I may have two, but I I, I can I can do it all in one here. Um, so most of the games, uh, Kagamatsu being an exception, um, <laughs> have well actually both of them as being uh, um, exceptions have you know one character sheet with a column for each character or actually several columns mashed together um which is awesome and for most use especially for like pbta it's great and that's all you need but sometimes um i've noticed this with forged in the dark games particularly uh but also you know some more complex games especially games that have uh, like multi-part playbooks or multi-part classes uh you need more room per character and the solution to that is, you know, obviously give each player their own tab. Of course, then you lose the ability to see other people's information all like on one screen. So there's a couple of solutions to that that I've seen. And um, this, there's one I've seen on several keepers, but since I happen to have this one open, this is it. This is an ugly prototype. I'm sorry. This is a game that does not yet exist. Um, <laughs> And it's, uh, I'm just kind of experimenting with it at the moment. But uh, let me share my screen here. Would help, wouldn't it? Oh, right. Okay. Yes. Expand the box and then share screen appears. Uh, there it is. Okay. So this character keeper here, like I said, this is an ugly prototype. Uh, for a game that doesn't exist, but so each player would have their own sheet like this right here. There's PC1, PC2, PC3, etc. And then so that everybody can see it at once, one of the solutions that I've seen, actually the only solution I think that I've seen is this right here. This is the summary sheet and this just pulls information from each of these other character sheets. And this one has uh, well, conditional formatting to show conditions for these characters, or it could be used for to show like harm tracks, things like that. If a character, you know, turns bright red, you know they're in trouble, and uh, maybe you should help them out, or maybe you shouldn't have them roll the next roll. Uh, this particular one has conditions that reduce um, a person's stats. So this light gray here is like their original stat, and this is their this is the stat they're currently rolling with. These are all very bad. So, you know, maybe you don't want Cindy here to do the next action, or maybe you should help her out. So this is all fine, but let's say you wanna be able to edit or, you know, work on your own character sheet and also see everyone else's at the same time. That's when you have this. And unfortunately, these are not as nicely formatted, but this is basically a little summary sheet that goes in the character keeper, or yeah, the character sheet for another character. And because of gauntlet style open table play where people rotate in and out, you can select Ooh. a character and get their stats, their current conditions. Um, eventually I will be adding like their bonds with you, uh, things like that um, under here. And then, you know, at the bottom you can add like your own notes about that character. Awesome. So, uh, like I said, this is, this is purely a prototype. I'm sure there will be issues with it that I'll come across, but I think this might be a good solution to the problem of both needing a whole lot of information about your character visible and also wanting to see other people's information at the same time. Wow, that could be the future. Uh, maybe, <laughs> or maybe it'll turn out to be so complex and breakable that nobody actually does it. I don't know, we'll see. I'll have to use it next time I do a, a Forge in the Dark game. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I need to laugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good example, like for a kind of game which might make uh, use of 
Yes. <laughs> I've noticed that all of the Forged in the Dark games that we have character keepers for have, you know, single tab per player, which is, you, you need it because there's a lot of information, but also like, it would be nice to see a summary. So uh, maybe next time I, I play one, I'll add a summary sheet or, or, or this, you know, mini summary sheet. I don't know. I would have two things to add to this. I really like this. And I remember that uh, I was in a Star Wars game together with you, uh, uh, which yes. uh, Rich Rogers had organized. Night Witches. Night Witches, yes. And there we had like separate tabs. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I couldn't help myself while we were playing. I was trying to get at least like the most important summary stats from the others on my character sheet. So I have them there. But it, uh, so you can also do it like, by yourself, like quickly, just by equal sign and then the cell you're mm -hmm. interested in and also equal sign to the name of the cell. Yes. But that doesn't look exactly good and takes up like not exactly the, the right amount of space and so on. So it would be nice to see this implemented directly. The other thing I remember was that we had a discussion like, the problem is like, if, if you have like a separate tab with all information together that's good for the gm but for the players the annoying thing is that you you are tempted to edit your character on the summary and then you destroy the links yes <laughs> that happens all the time when you have a, a summary tab that people are starting to only use the summary tab and forget about the separate tab or stuff like that yeah so we were discussing on the gauntlet like what else you could do and um one idea which came to my mind was that uh, you use check boxes for plus and minus, like if there are stats which go up by one, then each checkbox, uh, like the checkbox on top of the value could be plus one. So if you check that, then the value goes up by one. If you check one of the boxes below the, the, the stat, the value goes down by one. And these checkboxes, they could exist on the summary tab and they can exist on the player by players that the tab each player has because it would just nice. be another plus one, right? And then you could edit on both ends. Still easy to break, <laughs> unfortunately, but seem to be a solution that you use like the, the increment to be added, not the value itself. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this still, of course, has the problem where you have to type in the the tab name exactly in order to look it up. This uses an indirect function, uh, um, which, you know, if you have the tab name, or you can type them all in in a list somewhere, and this will be a drop down, or you'll know, refer to it, or you can just type it in here. Um, and if you get it, you know, exactly right with the right number of spaces and spelled right, uh, then your indirect function will look up that tab name from from that box. And then the reference, that way the cell reference can always be the same for each one, just a different tab name. Uh, that makes it a little easier. So if so people are moving in and out of the game, you can only show you know, the current five, four people who are involved at any given time, uh, instead of having to hide and copy and hide and copy new columns. Yeah, and there still isn't a way to to get a list of all the file. The, the sheet no, names no, I really wish there was. That would make things I mean, not that much easier. It's not that complicated to do, but it is sort of an extra task for the GM to remember. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I remember that there is no function, but I think that goes for Excel and not for Google Spreadsheet. Uh where you could like get without using VBA in Excel, get the name of the sheet and only which you're currently in. Yeah, in I wish it, it doesn't seem like a thing that would be super common for people to need in Google Sheets. It's great for gaming, but uh, it probably isn't that useful for you know your usual spreadsheet work. <laughs> so I, I don't really expect them to ever get around to it. Like it's uh, you know something just the the players or the GM are going to have to maintain to, to run these, I think, for a while. But maybe someday, maybe there will be a way to get a list of all your tab names. And yeah, that brings me to an important point. Like Google Spreadsheet is not made for creating character keepers. However, it is such a universal software spreadsheet calculations that it also works very well for character keeper creation. 
Um, that is often my issue with other platforms that if they are not designed for the purpose, like especially video call platforms, you can't completely rely on a feature. Like Google Hangouts was fantastic, now called Google Hangouts Classic, with the API, the overlays, uh, um, the dice roller built in. It was such a wonderful tool and it was taken away from us because the mainstream didn't need this functionality and like they needed, they considered it clutter and removed it. And so I, I really appreciate platforms like Roll and Roll20, which are designed for exactly our purposes, but then yeah, Roll20 is also designed for more thread kind of games and is often not catering for indie interests that might be changing in the future. And yes, it is still not the easiest, but um, they these platforms then have the issue that you are depending on a platform while I don't see spreadsheet functionality going away anytime soon in the future. <laughs> That's true. I mean, there are other spreadsheet apps uh, that, that are shared too. Google is just the one that everyone already has a Google account. So why not use it? But there are things like Zoho and uh, uh, there's there's a few, um, you know, in case Google for some reason decides to shut down Google Sheets, uh, we could probably port most of this over to something else with another kind of spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I for the most part, uh, I start designing my keepers in Excel on my desktop. Um, and then I port them across, I upload them and then transform them into a Google Sheet. And then I add my checkboxes. <laughs> um, but, um, and there's a few differences that I have to tweak, but I, I just prefer to you know, work offline if I'm, I want to concentrate on the... Uh, uh, on them initially, but yeah, I suspect that we'd be able to do something. Yeah, even if Google decides in its wisdom to shut down <laughs> Google Sheets like it has done so many of our favorite tools in the past. Would you be interested to see uh, a second keeper from my side, a prototype as well? Oh yeah, um, another yeah, creative definitely. like things that spreadsheets should not be able to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm talking about the ventriloquist uh, widget board. Um, let me share that screen with you. Um, so a friend of mine who is the official uh, translator uh, into German of the, um, the Society of Dreamers, again by Matthias Holster, um, um, said that you can't play this game online because you need a widget board to play it. Ouija boards are these boards with, with boxes, with uh, uh, letters in there. Or, and then you have a glass and everybody touches that glass and moves like while letting the ghosts or the spirits or whatever like flow through you, like guiding you and letting this glass move over the table and you reach letter by letter and like this letter build then words, which then can be used in the game as input. And that you said, you, how shall you do that online? That doesn't work. And I was like, yeah, that's true. That doesn't work. But um, only if you like try to translate that literally. We can't touch together an object and then m let it move together. So the, the random movements of each player add to something emerging, whatever that is. However, <clears throat> This is my attempt to still get the same kind of feeling. And we don't have touch, but we have words which we can share. Words which we can assume in the game that the, the spirits are sending through us. So we can, for example, the word tea, tea is coming through me and I can send this through you and everybody can also have like a word suddenly coming through them and being added. And these words then let this spreadsheet we just bought now, uh, what is happening. This is my prototype. It hasn't been used in a game yet, but that's um, my attempt to show that this is actually somehow possible and could be used. Let me explain how this works. So here you see plenty of many, many words in here, I delete them. And you see what I call the Ouija board of emojis here in the corner. It's pretty small, just six times six. And like with a circus tent, a globe, a heart, a king or queen, um, a palette, a banana, etc. on this. 
And you see one of them is shaded black in the background. That's the one where our virtual glass currently is. And now I type in the word Uhoo. And suddenly it jumps, it, ju it jumps. And it is at the police woman. Um, how did it do that? I just typed it. to you, Garrett. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. And now I type, aha, and it jumps to up to the king. What has happened here? And now let's let's move over through the control sheet because as you can see, there's player A, B, and C, so three different players, and each has a different setup, but they all look at this like that currently the king is highlighted here. So and here we are now, and I will delete this all these words because then it is easier to see what is happening. So player A has typed in words, two of them, and I concatenate these words. Ooh, aha, are now behind each other. And then I have a table here, which is counting the vowels. And it says, if there is an A, and play A has typed in together two times the letter A, and for each A, move two up in this coordinate system. For the letter U, you do the same, also move two up. And if you reach the end of the board, then start from the bottom again. So this is like circular. So this is why we saw this suddenly going two up and jumping over the, the, uh, the, the border of the board and then going two up more when I typed aha. In. So when we want to move this to the right, we need to type an I. So what about the word e e he or I hi? No, yeah, so where was it before? It was at the mushroom. That's because I deleted all the words and with a uh, hi, I'm two to the right. So now after a while, we might get an idea or we make like notes, like with which, which, which letters it moves into which direction and we can start to steer this. But at the same time, we're also like fully going into the character here and say this word, he, he, and now you could also join me and type your words and it moves again. This is how you make this uh, Ouija board move. Um, so this is also not that complicated spreadsheet technology in the end. You just need to have this coordinate system in place on the control sheet um, and play a little bit around this. So here are the starting coordinates. You start at three, uh, at three, three. So here at the palette. And when words are entered from there on, you add the ups and downs and lefts and rights. And that's all, that's all, yeah. Um, I'm still waiting for somebody to make a game out of that because I currently don't have the time, although I would really like to. Um, that is um, another way to make character keepers more than just um, taking notes and archiving values. Ultimately, do you think for this Ouija board that you would replace the emojis with the alphabet so that you could create words? Is that what you were thinking for the implementation or something else? That's, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I thought like it is, it is easier to say we, we put a counter like 60 seconds on and then the, the bell rings and then you end up on one thing and can interpret this. So the, what is like, you, you play just a normal role-playing game. So, and for resolution, you don't roll dice and try to hit a value or have a move or something, but you say the emoji is what we take as interpretation to resolve the scene. So you have the conflict with your teacher and you're standing up against your unfair teacher or something, and you end up as solution with the banana. Banana sounds like something went totally banana, maybe. So you just try to interpret this in the way uh, to continue playing the game. So why not using this as a simple resolution mechanic and using the emojis, of, it's like obviously police has a different outcome with a conflict with your teacher than the circus tent possibly has. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I would really like to see this being used in that kind of uh, sense. I would make the emoji board much larger, like 36 times 36 or so, so that you don't jump too often between categories yeah, and can steer a little bit more where you want to end up. 
Cool. Yeah, that's what I wanted to share. And I think we have seen quite some interesting keepers. Um, we have reached the end of the time we wanted to take for this panel, but maybe let's take one last round um, for some final words, some thoughts, something you have learned. And if you want, I can make a start. And I say that um, I, I like the culture around Character Keeper, it's a very welcoming culture. It's, uh, there's no like elitist kind of nonsense in there, but it's like, try something, do something. And it doesn't need to look good, but it needs to have made fun. Uh, it is an activity which I can count as playtime. When I sit down and make a keeper, that's as not exactly the same, but I already imagine I'm in the space of, uh, of of, of playing the game. It's like reading a module in the, in the good old times. <laughs> that kind of fun it is for me. Um, Mike, do you have final words for us? Sure, I agree. Um, if I'm learning a game for the first time, it doesn't have a keeper attached. The act of creating the keeper is a great, great way for me to synthesize the ideas of the game to know, hey, these are the important things to know. That must mean that these rules are important. These are the things I want my players to see. Yeah, and definitely, you know, the idea of holistic prep, you know, like instead of just reading the whole module, I want to be going to Pinterest. I want to be listening to music. I want to be creating a keeper and I want to be finding a font that feels evocative for, you know, if we're going into space, I want like a cool space font, you know, or for super spies, I want the old typewriter uh, font, you know, that sort of thing. Great little exercise, again, does not have to be a really cool thing, especially, you know, this might be the only time you play this game, but that's so why I'm very grateful for you curating the Gauntlet Play 8's folder because, you know, people are putting in this effort and it's a really nice way to be able to share that with other people to say, hey, maybe you don't want to spend an hour creating a spreadsheet here, but hey, I already did. And, you know, you could you could change it. You could, you could refine it. You could tweak it and it's free. <laughs> Just just take my labor of love. <laughs> so thank you for that, Garrett. Yeah, thank you for your very early contribution of making this kind of passion popular. Um, Bethany, do you have some final thoughts? Um, everybody's pretty much covered the, uh, what I was thinking about. I, I do think like, not only is it a really good way to prep for a game, like just building a character keeper for this game you're going to run. Um, I mean, I do that. And then between sessions, I make a, uh, a relationship map. And that's most of my prep right there. Uh, but like, also just, I've started designing games in a character keeper, which forces me to think of, okay, how do I present this information to the players? And if I'm getting into like four different layered dependent lists and tables, is this maybe too complicated? Maybe there's a simpler way to do this. Um, I, I think that like, it's a good way to sort of ground, like force your, your game rules to be usable uh, in, in practice. Although at this point now I'm kind of um, like with uh, there's a, there's a thing I've added to Unincorporated called character journals, which uh, uh, Garrett was mentioning earlier as a thing that, you know, he, he did it for, for fun. Uh, I've just like added it as a rule to the game. If you add a, if you use a character journal and someone, if, if you, if you look at someone else's character journal and you set a scene that uses that, you get a token. Uh, and then I was thinking, okay, how do I make a paper version of that? It's very easy in a spreadsheet. I have no idea how you make a paper version of that that's visible to everyone while you're writing it. So now, now it's, a, it's an opposite uh, implementation puzzle. Like, okay, cool. How do I emulate this virtual character uh, sheet in a real one? Uh, I think it does, it, I think that it influences, I mean, I know it influences my um, uh, game design, but I imagine it's, not only character sheets, but also virtual tabletops and just like how to, how this information is presented and what you can do with it is probably going to influence a lot of game design, uh, especially after this past year when everyone's playing online. Oh, yeah, oh, 
Thank you so much. So cool. Dono, final words. Um, I mean, I think what I what I really like about the character keepers, right, is that how they encourage and reinforce the culture we have of of quite willingly turning the spotlight on other characters at our tables, you know, because we we know what's important to them by just looking at the character keeper. So that I, I really like. And in some ways, you know, when we return to traditional tabletop, physical tabletop role playing. I, I want to see, you know, can can we use this technique? You know, I don't want everyone to be sitting with their laptop on a table, but can we do something with character keepers at a table, you know, um, to keep that kind of, you know, uh, uh, spirit uh, alive at the table? I don't know, uh, but it, it it does touch touch on what Bethany just said in terms of the the reversal back to tabletop. How do you how do you do that physically? So yeah, I'm interested to see whether we can we can crack that. So you know, I did this for LARP, saying I don't want this to be called online LARP. I want this to be called differently. Maybe maybe in a few years we are at a point where we introduce a term for games which are designed for online and are a puzzle to be translated into an offline world again. Yeah. Maybe we should start thinking about a name for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, that's um, our final, uh, these were our final words. Uh, we continue making keepers. Um, I put, as, as people usually say at the end of such sessions, I put everything else in the show notes, links and what we discussed. A link to the character keepers for sure will be in there. Also, I will link to Tomer's wonderful video where he presents also all the basics of making character keepers, which we skipped in the session. So this is absolutely worth watching um, if you just want to get accommodated to the topic itself and like how to put links and uh, lookups and stuff like that. So this was pretty advanced. Don't get intimidated, quite the opposite. Take this as an inspiration, I hope so. Thank you all for having been here. I stopped the recording now and